Okay, thank you. So away from the data talks, the first real theory talk. Uh, I'm not sure if you had one yesterday, but uh, so I've been asked to talk about particle acceleration mechanisms in astrophysics. Uh, because there are various ones that are the most prevalent, the ones that are most considered. So first, when I talk about particle acceleration mechanisms, I really just talk about mechanisms that are able to accelerate particles to relativistic energies into non-thermal distributions, typically something like power law distributions. What we'll discuss is the one that's most commonly known, first order Fermi acceleration, as it is assumed to happen in, in shocks. Uh, this is second order Fermi acceleration, it's also called stochastic acceleration. Magnetic reconnection is often considered, and one mechanism that's less well known is the shear layer acceleration. So on the first three, I'll borrow quite a lot actually from long air. So many of you may already have heard that in other lectures, but a refresher is probably not bad. First, a little more about astrophysical shocks, where we likely have Fermi acceleration, but possibly also magnetic reconnection. Uh, shocks happen when you have a flow that flows through another medium with more than the speed of sound. And the strength of the shock is essentially given by the ratio of the speed to the speed of, of sound. Now, considering different uh, environments, astrophysical environments, magnetic field always plays an important role. And one important aspect is if you have any medium, any plasma that has a very high magnetic field, as given by this magnetization, essentially the ratio of energy in magnetic fields and thermal particles. Uh, if that is much larger than one, that means magnetic field dominates everything that actually suppresses shocks. So even if you have a fast flow going through a highly magnetized medium, you're actually not likely to produce a strong shock that accelerates particles. And But then you can have this excess magnetic energy dissipated into particle energy. And that's what we uh, call magnetic reconnection. Shocks, of course, are also distinguished by their speed. Uh, most well understood are non-relativistic shocks as they happen in supernova remnants or winds of AGN, stellar winds. Uh, that means, of course, the shock speed is much less than the speed of light. There's an intermediate regime that uh, often is believed to happen when you have relativistic flows kind of catching up with each other so that the relative speed is actually kind of mildly relativistic. So normalized speeds times the Lorentz factor of the order one or a few or so. So internal shocks are often believed to uh, be in this regime. And then of course we have the extreme case of relativistic shocks that you have outflows that really move at essentially the speed of light, uh, like uh, gamma ray burst outflows, gamma ray burst jets that go with Lorentz factors of hundreds or up to thousands. So let's talk a bit. Uh, this first order Fermi acceleration mechanism at a strong non-relativistic shock. The situation is illustrated there. You have some fast flow moving through some stationary medium that we call the, the ISM interstellar medium. We can look at the same situation also from the frame of the shock wave that's going through. The shock wave, of course, then sees the ISM coming towards it with negative the speed of the shock wave. And of course, the material then isn't just stopped. Material comes in and flows out to the other direction. We don't have time to derive this compression ratio. If this is a strong non-relativistic shock, then typically the material behind the shock is four times denser than in front of the shock. And then just uh, mass conservation tells you that the speed behind the shock must be one quarter the speed of the material coming in. That means in the stationary frame of the ISM, the shock material that produces the shock comes in the three quarters of the shock speed. And the situation is then totally symmetric. The shock material sees the ISM coming in with the, the three quarters of the shocks. And this is now the fundamental idea of the first order Fermi acceleration mechanism. That the shock material sees stuff coming in with three quarters of the shock speed, everything gets an energy velocity and energy boost into its frame. And then a fundamental assumption and approximation here is that somehow the medium manages to isotropize particles again, even though they're coming in. 
in the frame of the flow, it's assumed that the particles are just going in all directions at the same probability. And then there's particles also bouncing back. And then the ISM sees the material coming in. So it gets another Doppler boost. We can just calculate that through. Hold on, I'll take you through a couple of slides of, of math here to actually derive the results for the energy gain and for the particle spectra that one can get. That's the nice thing about this uh, Fermi acceleration mechanisms. One can treat them very well uh, analytically with basic Lorentz transformation arguments for magnetic reconnection and the shear layers will see that analytic estimates either don't exist at all or they don't agree with numerical simulations. In the case of, of shocks, actually, people have also uh, studied these with MHD and with particle and cell simulations, and the results typically match very well these very basic estimates. So let's look at the Lorentz transformation. The Lorentz boost that a particle, already relativistic particle, gets when it goes from the moving frame of, say, the IFM with respect to the shock frame. We're in the shock frame. The ISM comes in, gives a Doppler boost to a particle coming in. So depending on the direction of motion of this particle, P is the particle's momentum, P is energy. So the standard expression for the Lorentz boost, V is the speed of the medium, in this case, the medium of the ISM with respect to the shock frame, uh, which is just the three quarter of the shock speed. <clears throat> so we have that. From that, of course, difference in energy is just this last term there. So the difference in energy over the original energy is just shock, shock speed over C times cosine theta. We'll see that this is an effect that is really just first order in the shock speed. So scales linearly with, with the speed. That's why we call this first order Fermi acceleration. Now, we have to average this somehow over all directions in which particles can move. Again, we assume that particles don't have a preferred direction in the rest frame of the ISM and later in the rest frame of the shock material. So the probability of crossing is simply just proportional to the cosine of the angle with respect to the shock normal. And so the probability is that the cosine theta now averaged over this probability is just the cosine square theta, d cosine theta over, then we have to normalize. So that's the total probability. So the probability of just having any angle must be one. So we just integrate this cosine theta as well. And it's easy to see that that gives you effective two thirds. So per one cross shocking, the particle gains a relative energy relative to its original energy of half the shock speed over the speed of light. Um, and that means, of course, if we go back and forth, the situation is totally symmetric because ISM sees the shocked material coming in with the same speed as the shock receiver sees the ISM coming in. So you gain an energy of shock speed over C uh, for one back and forth cross shocking. So let's write this as the energy after double crossing being a beta times the energy before. So beta is then this one plus shock velocity over C. Now, let's see if we can evaluate the spectrum that comes out of this. So for now, we've only calculated what's gained by one shock crossing, but to get the spectrum of particles that results from it, we need to figure out how many shock crossings does a particle undergo before it's eventually swept away behind the shock and leaves the system. For that, we just have to consider how many particles are coming through the shock front, uh, relativistic particles that are being accelerated, and how many particles are being swept away. This ratio of particles coming in and particles being swept away gives you the probability of leaving, and that also gives you the probability of staying in the system. So if you have particles being isotropically distributed, then right at the shock front, half the particles will go away from the shock, the other half of particles will go towards the shock. And then if you average the cosine theta, that means the actual net speed uh, along the flow direction, uh, 
cosine theta average over all angles from zero to one uh, just gives you half uh, of the speed of light. That means the next flux of particles near the shock front is the density of particles at the shock front times one quarter times the speed of light. So that's the flux coming in. But coming out is just the density of particles that have come in times uh, the speed with which they're being evacted away. That is the one quarter of the shock speed. So the ratio gives you the probability of leaving. So one minus that ratio gives you the probability of actually staying in the system. Now, if we have not just one shock crossing, if you have many shock crossings, K shock crossings, then the energy after K crossings is just inspect to beta to the power of K times the original energy. And the probability of still being in the system, on the other hand, after those K crossings, is this remaining probability P to the power of K. Then we can just take these logarithms there. So the left uh, ratio of, of N, you take the, the second equation there. That logarithm, of course, gives you K times ln of P. The denominator gives you K times ln of beta. The Ks will cancel out. So the ratio gives you just ln P, ln beta. And we're talking about non-relativistic shocks, so very small fractions U over C. That means the ln of one plus something small is just that uh, argument, ln one of one plus epsilon is just epsilon for very small values of epsilon. So this gives you just minus u over c divided by u over c, so minus one. So what this really gives us is the number of particles that are still in the system that have an energy larger than some given energy. So it's the integral of our distribution from a given energy to infinity. So if that integral gives you an e to the minus one, that means the actual differential distribution is energy to minus two. I'm sure you've all heard this before, that strong shocks, strong non-relativistic shocks without considering magnetic fields give you an e to the minus two spectrum. And this does not depend on any other parameters. In particular, it doesn't depend on shock speeds or anything as long as it's a strong shock. It's a very fundamental result that these shocks give you an e to the minus two spectrum. Now, of course, this was really just this uh, effect of very strong shocks. If the shocks are not so strong, uh, not so strong, so that means the shock speed is just a little bit more than uh, the sound speed, then it turns out the spectra gets softer and softer. And again, this gets too complicated to really do any calculations here. The shocks give you uh, steeper energy spectrum, a very fundamental results that's also derived analytically is a little bit counterintuitive you might first think because if you have a shock that's not non-relativistic but it's actually relativistic, you would naively think that's even more powerful, that's even better at accelerating particles. The problem there is that if the shock moves relativistically, it's much more difficult for particles once they've crossed the shock catch up with it again because well they're moving with the speed of light the shock is almost moving with the speed of light so they're actually for that reason less efficient than non-relativistic shocks where particles have an easy time crossing back and forth because they're moving much faster than, than the shock so that gives you also a very fundamental uh, universal result of an index of 2.2 to 2.3 so that's been verified also by numerical simulations now the situation becomes more complicated if we actually have mildly relativistic shocks, but then also the orientation of the magnetic field plays an important role. So much so that actually the situation becomes again so complicated that meaningful analytical approximations aren't actually in place. So what people are doing, several groups, uh, is really simulating individual particles going through the shock spiraling along magnetic field lines and then being thrown off the field lines and reversed, and then seeing how efficiently they can bounce back and forth. 
one important aspect when considering these oblique shocks, as we should know them. Uh, so that means the magnetic fields that has a certain angle with respect to the shock front in the stationary ISM. Then if the shock moves through, you probably all heard that compresses the magnetic field in the plane of the shock. So this angle actually becomes larger between magnetic field and the flow direction of the shock normal. And now when particles say behind the shock are trying to cross back in the magnetic fields, they're pretty much bound to move along magnetic fields, along magnetic field lines. So, and at the same time, everything being swept away with this quarter of the shock speed, the V2, as we call it here. But if they're moving along the magnetic fields with some angle that we call theta V2, then the net catching up with the shock is really just the cosine of that angle times the particle speed. And so if the inclination is too large, that particles would have to move faster than the speed of light to actually still catch up with the shock. Then we talk about superluminal shocks and it's immediately clear that that makes it very difficult to accelerate particles. Because particles, once they've crossed the shock, they just be swept away because they're not fast enough to get back. So now my colleague, uh, Matthew Baring and student and uh, El Summerlin have done a lot of these simulations, Monte Carlo simulations of this diffuser shock acceleration process. The main takeaway point here is that depending on the parameters, so how efficient it is to bounce particles back towards the shock front uh, and the obliquity, um, you can get very different particle spectra. You always have a heated thermal pool of electrons, but then the shock acceleration, the diffusive shock acceleration, pulls particles out to an index that can be almost anything. So illustrated here is for the x-axis here, we don't need to worry about what that actually is. It's essentially the obliquity of the magnetic field. So the further to the right we go, the further the magnetic field is tilted against the, the shock front. And plotted against that is the spectral index of the non-thermal particle distribution that is produced by diffusive shock acceleration. And really the takeaway point here is that pretty much anything from one up to two, three can be achieved here. So depending on what's the actual configuration is, you can get particle spectra as hard as e to the minus one. And in fact, quite often when you hear people working on magnetic reconnection uh, talk, they often claim that only magnetic reconnection can give you as hard spectra as e to the minus one is really not true. This uh, mildly relativistic shocks can, can do the same thing. Any questions on, on this before we go on to second order, to second order Fermi acceleration? Let me take a little breather. Sure. So what will be the maximum energy we can achieve uh, by uh, this problem one? The maximum energy is usually given by balance of the acceleration rates that we have. Acceleration rate, of course, essentially the rate of crossings times uh, energy gain uh, and radiative losses. Because radiative losses we have not included in this, that usually limits it. So the rate of crossings and energy gain gives you the rate at which energy is gained. And radiative energy losses like synchrotron or pontium uh, pulls energy out. And at some point, you have a balance. So the energy uh, gain rate is typically something proportional to Lorentz factor, whereas the loss rate goes for synchrotron as gamma squared. That means at some point, the synchrotron loss rate will intercept, and uh, that limits your acceleration. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll just shout. Um, mm -hmm. How relevant is what you've been talking about for the non relativistic shocks to uh, systems that have magnetically confined plasmas where you have an accretion which can be described as a as a one fluid model where the electrons and protons are in equilibrium, which then produces a shock? Um, I mean. Is it 
is it within your model here that you can treat such I think it's, um, I mean, not, not the very basic uh, analytical estimates, right? I mean, we have ignored magnetic fields there. As I said, if the magnetic fields really dominates, then everything looks quite different anyway. But I mean, anything. I, think, yeah, I mean, in terms of these um, shock models, the magnetic field is just defining. It's not doing anything other than, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously electrons are spiraling, but. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to get my head around whether the um, papers that were written in the 70s and 80s are sort of one fluid models where they explain it by the deceleration of the material. So the velocity mm -hmm. goes down by a quarter and then it cools by a quarter. Mm -hmm. Is this within the same scheme or is it something in front of I'm not familiar with those papers. I work on quite different things. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, then let's move on to the second part. Again, uh, also second order Fermi mechanism can be treated uh, quite accurately with nice analytical uh, considerations. The situation we're talking about here is now that we do not have just two media that effectively each from each other's frame are approaching each other. So where each time you get a positive boost being boosted back and forth. Here we're talking about some scattering centers, let, let's call them uh, clouds that bounce the particles around, but the clouds are now not moving in a directed way or towards each other, but they're moving in just random directions. So this same often applies to turbulence as well. If you have just some kind of plasma turbulence that deflects um, particles as they include, uh, they interact with, with turbulent cells, uh, then, then this is uh, kind of the situation. But just for, for illustration, one can say that these are clouds that are parting, uh, bouncing particles off. Now, the situation, if the particle is so on the left, the particle is moving kind of head on towards the cloud, then it gets a positive boost when it's just bounced off and bounced back. But on the other hand, if you're giving tail on, the uh, cloud is moving away from you, then actually kind of you're imparting energy onto the cloud, you're actually losing energy. So you can both have energy loss and energy gain. But on the other hand, I mean, the probability of encountering something is higher when you're going head on to something than you're going away. So if you drive on the highway on the wrong side of the road, you're more likely to hit another car than if you're going on the right, meaning the left, uh, so the, the correct side of the road. Right? <laughs> Just trust the theorists on this one. Don't try it out. <laughs> so energy gain is more likely than energy loss because you're more likely to encounter something head on than tail. All right, let's play that Lorentz transformation game again. The transformation looks exactly the same. Uh, only as we will see, we now actually need to take second order effects into account. So we will see the first order effect that was nicely dominating in first order Fermi acceleration will actually drop out in this case. So we have here the transformations for energy and the x direction of the momentum, assuming that uh, the cloud is moving in the in the x direction here. Uh, and the assumption is that the cloud scattering center, whatever, doesn't by itself give energy to the particle or take energy away in its rest frame. So in the frame of the clouds, the particle just bounces off elastically. That's the assumption. And we can do that same transformation again. So we get another boost by the same Lorentz factor, gamma of the cloud. And then just uh, plug in what we have there. So first it's just from the cloud frame back to the, to the ISM. And then we just plug in what we found here for E prime and P prime. And simplify that a little bit. The, the key, the particle momentum can write in terms of energy so that we get an energy factor in all three terms there. And we can also rewrite the Lorentz factor a little bit as long as it's non-relativistic. That's about one plus. 
So then we can solve this. Uh, what we get is then the final uh, expression there. You see that there are terms of first order, first order in, in beta cloud, so cloud speed uh, over C. And we are now also carrying second order terms along. So recall that the probability of colliding with a cloud is one plus beta times cosine of the relative velocities. Uh, for simplicity, we'll soon say the particle is already relativistic, so the beta of the particle is about one. And we'll save ourselves a bit of writing by calling mu the cosine of the angle between cloud velocity and the particle's trajectory. Now, if we were just doing this to first order, as we've done for the first order Fermi acceleration, then the only surviving term of delta E over E it's just the, the linear term there in, in beta cloud. But then, if we're only taking the first order uh, in, in beta, then from probability also, we need to neglect the beta because we already have a beta in front of everything. So if we took that along, then we'd have a second order term. So if we only have the first order term, then we only take the one from the collision probability and then the integral trivially comes out to zero. Which of course makes perfect sense. We've said energy gain and energy loss may be exactly the same for head-on and tail-on. It's only the probability of head-on being uh, larger. But if we neglect this uh, term for the probability being larger, then of course that effect drops out. So this is why we need to go to second order here. Second order, we just take both terms that survive there um, and simply just multiply this out plus the beta cloud squared plus the one from the second parentheses gives you another beta cloud squared. So you got just two beta cloud, beta p mu, two beta cloud squared. And then we don't need to go at length through calculating that integral. It's in effect the same as we've done for the first order, only that the term now looks a bit more complicated. If we only keep the second order terms in there, so there are of course mixing terms with beta to the third, we need like those. We've just seen the linear term in beta drops out. What we're left with is terms in beta squared and the factor is just a third beta cloud. That means of course, if we have a non-relativistic shock, beta much less than one, then beta square, of course, is much smaller than beta. So that means in principle, this second order mechanism is much less efficient because you're constantly battling energy gain and energy loss and only gradually building up the dominant energy gain. Okay, so that gives us average energy gain. Um, let's see if we can convert that into a rate of energy that might then give us how particle spectrum might evolve and what kind of spectrum we get eventually in some kind of equilibrium. So now, realistically, particles are not moving in straight lines. There's magnetic fields, particles will spiral around. So the actual distance that so the guiding center of the spiraling motion is covering is really just the pitch angle. So the angle between velocity and magnetic field the cosine of the pitch angle times its actual speed. So that means the actual speed um, is really just C times cosine of phi. Then the time to cross the average distance between clouds is L, so of course directly related to the density of scattering centers. So the time between collisions is then just L over C cosine phi. And you can average that over all angles easily that gets you just a factor of two. And then we can easily calculate the energy gain rate. So the rate at which particles pick up energy, we know that delta E over E times E just gives you delta E over delta T. So what we find is something that's proportional to E times a factor alpha, and that is given by the expression there. As you'd expect, energy gain is larger, is more efficient, if the cloud velocity increases, so it's proportional to beta squared, that's second order term. And as you also expect, it gets larger if the cloud density is larger, that means the distance between the clouds gets smaller. So it's naturally what you expect. 
list we have. And now to figure out what the particle spectrum eventually will be, we need to uh, make more assumptions. The simplest thing we do again is assume everything's nice and isotropic. We can calculate this with an isotropic for the Planck equation that calculates the rate of change in time of an energy distribution uh, as a function of energy, essentially the second term, uh, some drift in energy of the particles, minus particles that get lost out of the acceleration. We're looking for an equilibrium. So we're just setting the right-hand side to zero, but nothing changes anymore. That gives us an equilibrium distribution. Then that means, first of all, we only get an equation that's dependent on energy because we're in equilibrium, nothing depends on time anymore. Uh, we get this energy derivative there that can be easily calculated. Uh, finally, we get the n over de, so the differential spectrum. Uh, so the, actually, the derivative of the differential spectrum is some constant that we call minus x times n over e. And of course, the equation that solves that is simply just a power law again, namely e to the minus x. Easy to figure out. If you have and not e to the minus x, take the derivative, you get minus x and not e to the minus one plus x. So that's n of e over e. So we have a particle spectral index. Again, we have a power law from second order Fermi. But now, unlike Fermi first order, this is not a universal power law index. It depends very much on alpha, the energy gain efficiency, this beta square term, and the escape time scale. But we can look at limiting case, for example. So if the acceleration efficiency becomes very large, say by having very densely packed scattering uh, centers, L very small, or alternatively, if the escape time scale is very large, that means even if the acceleration is very slow and inefficient, but if you have a very long time for that to act, you can still get a very hard spectrum. So if alpha and or tau escape time scale get very large, then the second term in X goes to zero. That means also with this, in these extreme situations, you can get up to E to minus one particle spectrum. And in this case, also to answer Sundiel's previous question, the cutoff will be given by uh, either balancing energy escape, uh, energy gain with escape, uh, or energy gain with loss value. Good. That was it. That was most of the heavy math that we had so far. Take a little breather. Any questions? One question from my side, one thing that every X-ray astronomer should know. What do you get when you irradiate a seal with X-rays? Anybody? What do you get when you irradiate a seal with X-rays? A sea lion. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Ready to go on? Are there not any questions? Yeah. I'm wondering what kind of astrophysical environments um, these two uh, kind of thing access or what could you be maybe a kind of environment where plus button any acceleration work then the other First order Fermi acceleration, as I said, that's really primarily in shocks. So relativistic shocks like supernova remnants or wind, stellar wind interactions. 
in stochastic interaction uh, often happens where yeah, you have turbulence building up. That can also happen behind shocks, actually, but there, it's then often the subdominant uh, mechanism. Also, you have turbulence, you have tangled magnetic fields that bounce particles around that work ineffectively this way. So the approximation with the clouds is just kind of a visualization. It's usually not actually clouds that do that. It's often magnetic fields, inhomogeneities that bounce particles around and can lead to this acceleration. I mean, we see power law spectra and radiation in many environments. So certainly uh, this is, I mean, one of these is going on, but it's still not clear what actually is the dominant radiation mechanism. Especially since now both the second order Fermi and the mighty relativistic shocks, they can produce particle spectral index of, of any kind. And a lot of like supernova remnants, radio spectra, AGN, jet, radio spectra, and optical spectra show, show power law distributions that reflect essentially the power law distribution of the electrons. So that means that one of these processes is likely to happen, but which one is still very much a debate, especially in things that I work on AGN jets, there's a big debate if that is magnetic reconnection or shock accelerations. So it's very difficult to tell just from the observations, but there's definitely nothing ruling anyone out. I also wonder if you could uh, explain how the relativistic battle of shocks uh, still mm -hmm. end up with like soft disk data. Mm -hmm. uh, the point, I think I mentioned it briefly, is that there the shock moves already with the speed of light, even with respect to the material behind the shock. So the particle moves with the speed of light, the shock moves with the speed of light. It's much more difficult for a particle behind the shock to catch up with the shock again and cross again. So that, that's what makes it less efficient. If the speed is non relativistic, the particles move with speed of light, it's easy for them to reach the shock again. But the shock already moves with almost speed of light, and that's what makes it. And we come to the last two mechanisms. Where, as I said, it's much more difficult, if not impossible, to really uh, make any analytic estimates. So, for most of what I'm talking now, we're talking about results of numerical simulations uh, of these acceleration processes. So, magnetic reconnection <clears throat> means that we have a high energy density in magnetic fields, and we have configurations where magnetic fields are going in opposite directions. And then well, magnetic fields in opposite directions, as we'll see in a minute, will produce strong currents. These currents can dissipate energy. Magnetic fields are effectively destroyed and the energy converted into energy of particles. So in order for this to actually dissipate energy, we need the plasma, as it is naturally happening in all plasmas, to have a finite uh, conductivity. So that means there must be energy dissipation from the currents uh, otherwise, of course, you can't dissipate energy. <clears throat> so the energy release can be roughly estimated. I promise that's the last bit of math that I'm showing here uh, by just saying that if you have oppositely directed magnetic fields, then that gives you a strong curl of the magnetic field. You have a very strong gradient across the magnetic fields here that gives you a strong curl. And then Maxwell's equations without electric fields uh, tell you that that must give you a current that's driven in this plasma. So if you rewrite this equation in this way and then do an integral over the, the whole area of this dissipation that has a length L and height of small L or width small L, integral over the area, well, just integrates J over the area and integral of um, 
a vector quantity over an area with one of Gauss's laws, you can write as the integral over the boundary of that area times the, the curl of the, the vector. The curl of J was, uh, so, so the curl of B, uh, J is the curl of B. So that means we can write this as B times integral over the boundary. So on the left hand side, this gives us J times times the area, L times small L. And the dominating magnetic fields going in opposite directions on top by the bottom, but the integral also goes in opposite directions, top and bottom. So you get just 2L times the magnetic field as a very rough estimate. So we can estimate what the current is. And then the energy dissipation just from resistivity is just J square over sigma. So we have a very rough analytic estimate of the energy dumped into the plasma from magnetic reconnection. But this is about as far as we'll go in doing actual hands-on physics. The only real way to calculate, especially the actual individual particle acceleration and calculate energy spectra that come out is with simulations and particularly suited for this is this type of simulations we call particle and cell simulations that trace particles, individual particles that represent actually many particles themselves, but still it's a large number of particles that's traced and fields that are being generated. And it's a problem very similar to GR. We say matter tells mass how to curve, curvature tells mass uh, <clears throat> how to move. Uh, so the particles cause generate fields through their charges and motions. Uh, but the fields also tell the particles how they move. Particle and cell simulations do exactly this back and forth, evolving particles a little bit, calculating the fields again, evolving the particles again, and so on. Uh, on large grids, this is just one example. There's a huge body of literature on particle and cell simulations of magnetic reconnection. Uh, most of them find uh, results that are very similar to what uh, we see here. So we typically see the thermal heated pool of electrons, but then pool of non-thermal electrons being pulled out. Uh, this is what I said, this can get up to index e to the minus one. And one can get a very rough estimate in terms of the magnetization. So if you have a very large magnetization, you can get a rough estimate of the maximum energy that you can reach with magnetic reconnection as just about of the order of this magnetization factor. You can see here that magnetization is 100. The cutoff is, again, of the order of 100, so cutoff energy. You can also see in the right plot, uh, as a function of the magnetization, the spectral index that comes out, takeaway point here is that with increasing magnetization, you get harder spectra, and again, spectra extending out to higher energies. This is as far as I wanted to go here with the Reconnection, as I said, there's a huge body of literature that's impossible now to treat in any more detail. Last thing, I'll talk about uh, shear boundary layers, since I've been involved also in a little bit of the work uh, on this. One sees in both in, in observations, one sees here the, the jet of M87. You naturally expect if you have a jet, like in an AGN, moving out very fast, there must be slower stuff somewhere outside. It's not that's immediately vacuum outside. And also in simulations, you see that when you have something driving a jet, there's typically something fast going inside, call it a spine, and then a slower layer outside. So there is velocity shear, something fast going through something smaller. And that produces, it can produce turbulence, and it can very likely accelerate particles. There have been quite a few. Analytical estimates, in particular these two here, Rico and Duffy have worked a lot on that, uh, but we're, we're not going into a lot of detail. Just, just to say that the very basic idea, it's natural that you expect part of it to be accelerated. If say the lower region here is something stationary and you have a fast spine moving with a large Lorentz factor gamma, you bounce a particle from the lower layer up into the, the moving layer, you get an energy boost by this Lorentz factor. And if you're going on top on average, then the beta dot P 
will be zero because the velocities and momenta are perpendicular. So you just get one energy. And then if you bounce the particle back, you say you're stationary in that fast moving spine, then of course the stationary thing moves with the same Lorentz vector in the opposite direction. So you get the same energy boost again. That's the very basic idea, as I'll show. Numerical simulations show that the reality is actually much, much more complicated. Uh, so there have been some analytical estimates there, but that depend very much on strong assumptions like the isotropization of the particle. So assuming that the particles, once they're in the other region, there's again isotropic. We'll see in the end that that is actually not true. <clears throat> uh, so and in many cases, in fact, these analytical estimates not really reproduce what the numerical simulations uh, are producing. And again, these particle and cell simulations are probably the most successful and most efficient way <coughs> of treating this. So there I've, I've been involved in, in a few words, especially uh, with my former postdoc supervisor, Edison Liang at Rice University in Schuster. Uh, so doing big simulations of these uh, Shear layers with the fast spine here going to the right, the slow sheath to the left, putting that hole into an equal Lorentz factor frame. So a moving frame in which spine and sheath are going with the same Lorentz factor in opposite directions. And the first thing that comes out is what we see in here that's electric and magnetic fields that are self generated by the plasma by this shear. The simulations actually started out with no fields at all. This is all what the motion has actually produced by itself. And we'll see that these fields are actually much more dominating the dynamics of the particles than this simple one-shot acceleration idea. You can see that if we have a pure electron photon plasma, we have well-ordered magnetic fields that are very efficiently accelerating particles. The self-generating electric fields that can really just give electrostatic acceleration. If we have a pure pair plasma, then the whole thing actually becomes very turbulent and there's really no net effect of any acceleration there, as we'll see here. So this is now the energy spectra that come out. The pure pair plasma where everything just turns chaotic. You don't really have a strong heating effect, but for hybrid or electron proton plasmas, you really accelerate particles out to high Lorentz factors of a thousand or 10,000. And it's really only for this blue case here where you have protons, but also a few pairs in there that you have what you get from other mechanisms like a thermal pool and some power law going out there. So these, these power law distributions are very difficult to produce actually in these simulations quite opposite to the analytical estimates that people have developed. Uh, big simulations really do not get that. And I've already alluded, the most interesting thing is, that's a, a big problem here lies in this assumption that particles are isotropic in either one of the frames. But it's plotted here as a function of the electron Lorentz factor in these simulations. Effectively, the angle that their momentum makes with respect to the, the jet axis, the spine axis. <clears throat> and you see, uh, so for those of you working on AGM and uh, lasers, uh, I will introduce that also in my second talk on, on Tuesday a little bit more. If you have something moving along the jet with some Lorentz factor gamma, then all of the radiation is beamed within the characteristic angle of one over gamma, the typical special relativistic uh, aberration effect. What this shows is that many of the particles are moving actually concentrated in a much narrower direction than this one over gamma. So we get much stronger boosting here, and we have an extremely anisotropic distribution. It shows this assumption of particles just being isotropic in either one of the frames is just totally not holding here anymore. It's really important, and I think in this, this paper in 2017 with Edison Liang, we were the first to really point this out. Uh, that the anisotropy is really an important thing. My PhD student, Paul Chan, is also working on radiation output from this kind of situation. So this shows as a function of angle with respect to the uh, jet axis, the intensity that comes out 
and the vertical line shows the one over gamma and also again shows that the beaming is actually much more narrowly uh, concentrated towards the jet axis than just if everything was isotropic in the jet. Uh, and that's uh, all I was going to say about this. I think that the uh, lecture was really self-explaining everything. <laughs> we had a couple of questions. Okay. Anyway, yeah. thanks a lot.